starting starting yeah there we go um all right well hello and welcome everyone um this is the kickoff of the surgical education initiative i'll hand it over to the chair uh dr Anand Khalid, who i think is muted You guys hear me? Okay, so al khair, almost al khair, everyone. I'm uh, a vascular surgeon in Oregon, uh, This is the kickstart for a series of grant rounds. Uh, this is intended to uh, share our experience and knowledge with the residents, students, residents, and fellows, and practicing surgeons, um, both in the United States and Jordan. Uh, we also will be having another series for interesting cases and case um, discussions, um, not an M&M, but more of um, sharing experiences and what would be the best case scenario to deal with each case uh, based on the circumstances of your practice. Uh, I just want to mention that none of these lectures are to replace your uh, medical school training or fellowship training or residency. This is merely to share an experience and hopefully assist as much as we can. Um, and today our speaker is Dr. Ahmed Abu Taqa, uh, who he did his residency and uh, in general surgery and his training in acute care surgery and work on for Doha, Qatar. But then he did his uh, surgical critical care fellowship in University of Minnesota. And now he's a chief resident at the University of Minnesota. So he will be quadruple boarded in at least two general surgery boards from two different countries and two critical care specialties from two different countries as well. Um, and um, the floor is yours. All right. Assalamu alaikum, sabah al khair, or masa al khair. Thank you, uh, Dr. Anan, for the kind kind introduction. Um, I am currently a chief resident at the University of Minnesota in general surgery, and acute pancreatitis has been a, uh, an interest to me, like uh, the patient population and also the disease itself and the intervention that we do for these patients. So. I'm going to shed some light on acute pancreatitis and review with you the medical management and operative management for these patients. So we're going to talk about a little bit about introduction. I have a case presentation first, and then uh, uh, we'll do introduction and definitions of acute pancreatitis that we commonly use. Uh, and then we'll jump on management, uh, which include medical management and the interventions, whether these uh, our interventional radiology um, managements or interventions or surgical interventions. And then uh, we'll end up with take home messages. I have no disclosures. All right, so we have a 39 year old male with history of alcohol abuse. He came into the emergency department with epigastric pain for two days uh, associated with nausea and vomiting. The pain is constant and it's been in the, uh, it's been radiating to the back uh, since it started. Uh, and it's been increasingly worsened uh, throughout uh, the course of, of, of the last two days. Um, he had similar milder episodes of the pain in the past, but nothing as severe as this one. On physical examination, uh, probably we'll start with the vitals. He had like a low grade temp of 38.3. Sinus tachycardia of 110 and uh, um, hypotension with his blood pressure of being 90 over 60. Um, his abdomen is distended with diffuse tenderness to palpation, worse over the epigastrium and uh, no other gu no guarding or rigidity, uh, and he's not jaundiced. Other signs we look for in the uh, in acute pancreatitis, mainly for medical students, is Collins sign and Gray Turner. And uh, usually these um, uh, gave me a hard time to remember which is which, but the gray turner is two words and you have two flanks. So gray turner, you'll find it in flanks and Collins, it's a very umbilical ecchymosis. And this might indicate some hemorrhagic component of acute pancreatitis when you see it. Uh, lipase is 18,000, which is uh, elevated. Emily is 7,800. And uh, mild elevation of transaminases with AST of 124 and ALT of 79. Uh, bilirubin and alkaline phosphatase were normal and this creatinine was normal. Uh, glucose is 230 and lactate dehydrogenase 411. Uh, hematocrit 48 and white cell count is 16.4. Uh, uh, triglyceride is also high. So these 
lab results just shed light on two important things, which um, medical students and residents, surgery residents and medical residents would use, uh, which is the scoring system of acute pancreatitis. The first one is Ranson criteria, um, which uh, will calculate the mortality risk uh, for the patient. And uh, it has two calculations, one at admission and the other one 48 hours after admission. Uh, and also it uh, shed light on some of the causes of pancreatitis in this patient would be triglyceridemia, hypertriglyceridemia. Um, and of course, we will discuss what's, what we're gonna do to this patient uh, through the course of this presentation. Um, so if you do a CT scan for this patient, uh, we will discuss when is the best time to do this CT scan. Uh, but if you can see here, uh, the pancreas is just this what's happening here. It's inflamed. And this is the tail of the pancreas, mainly has big inflammation with collection, some necrosis, and you see gas uh, bubbles in that collection, indicating infection. So acute pancreatitis include wide spectrum disease. Uh, it can be caused by um, many causes and it also by itself has uh, many presentations uh, ranging from mild pancreatitis to severe pancreatitis and uh, complicated with necrosis and infected necrosis at the end. Um, lots of admission you will see either in US or wild world, uh, worldwide, especially uh, if the causes of pancreatitis and the, the causes of pancreatitis will differ from uh, an area to another. And uh, around third, of these patients will develop necrosis. Um, the necrosis mostly will be sterile necrosis, but it can be secondarily infected, which uh, carries high morbidity and mortality in these patients up to 60%. And these patients will require intervention down the line. Down the line. So what are, what are, what are, what are? Um, I'm, I'm hearing some just echoes, yeah. Thank you for muting. Um, all right, so this is acute pancreatitis. Um, the first phase, which is the early phase, uh, happens during the first week. So from presentation up to seven days, it is a result of the uh, inflammatory response and the cytokine response from the uh, patient. And uh, uh, this first week is very important in terms of the resuscitation and, and uh, determining the severity of uh, the pancreatitis because uh, these patients, even if they come with organ dysfunction initially, uh, the persistence of and duration of organ dysfunction is the determinant of their severity, not only uh, if it's there or not. And then the late phase, which progresses uh, in these severe cases to a systemic um, signs of inflammation, local complications, or uh, even systemic complication, and persistent organ failure, uh, which remain the main determinant of severity and mortality. So how we define it, uh, revised Atlanta classification provides us just a, a map for that, the mild acute pancreatitis, where we don't have organ failure and no uh, local or systemic complications. And if you do a CT scan, for these patients, you will find uh, some interstitial edema uh, of the pancreas, um, which we call interstitial pancreatitis. And then moderately severe acute pancreatitis, which has organ failure, but this organ failure resolves within the first 48 hours. Uh, or the patient would have a local or systemic complication without persistence of the organ failure. If the patient has organ failure up, uh, after 48 hours, then this is called a severe acute pancreatitis. And this organ failure can be single or multiple. Um, lots of people use Ranson criteria for severity. I usually prefer this because um, it's, it takes a snapshot of uh, the patient uh, 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 demographics in addition to uh, lab results and tell you on the spot what is the severity of the pancreatitis and the expected mortality. 
basically every point in this table uh, takes one point. Uh, so it's easy to remember. Uh, so BUN more than 8.9, uh, impaired mental status, systemic inflammatory uh, syndrome is present, uh, the age is more than 60, and pleural effusion on X-ray. If you have five out of five, then the mortality rate is 22% or higher. So going back again to the definition of terms, uh, as we said, the first one is the interstitial edematous pancreatitis which is acute inflammation of the pancreas and peripancreatic tissue, but you don't have tissue necrosis. And this can be subdivided into two, uh, 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 two distinct morphologies on the CT scan. The first one is acute peripancreatic fluid collection, which is something like that. You see the edema on the pancreas and the uh, inflammation of the pancreas, and there is some peripancreatic fluid but there is no, um, no wall, walling of this collection. If you wait enough and um, this collection for somehow um, organized, then you will have something called the uh, pancreatic pseudocyst, which you see here. So it's a homogeneous uh, pancreatic, peripancreatic fluid collection with a recognizable wall around the pancreas and uh, mostly, by definition, it happens after four weeks, or you can call it pancreatic pseudocyst after four weeks. Then the other um, morphology uh, or the associated local complication that you can look at on the CD scan is the necrotizing pancreatitis. And you can look at it as a uh, one of the um, like more severe forms of pancreatitis or like a distinct disease by itself. Uh, because these patients usually they don't come for a day or two of pancreatitis, like mild pancreatitis, and then they develop necrotizing pancreatitis out of the sudden. When they come, usually they come really sick and they have uh, signs and symptoms and also some features on the CT that might indicate necrotizing pancreatitis in majority of them. Um, the first one uh, is the acute necrotic collection, which is less than four weeks of, uh, of the necrosis, like this one. So you'll see there is mixed, um, um, uh, mixed fluid with some solid uh, component in the peripancreatic collection, but there is no distinct wall. Uh, sometimes you will see gas in this collection, which indicates infection, as we will discuss shortly. Uh, and then when you have thick wall like this, it's a walled off necrosis, which happens also uh, by time. And usually the cutoff is four weeks. And uh, if you find like some solid components, this indicates a necrosis, or if you find some gas, like um, uh, a density which is, uh, sorry, uh, intensity which is lower than this, like a gas intensity uh, or density, it will be uh, infected, uh, walled off necrosis. And the words have power. So you cannot uh, say that the patient has inf have infected necrosis and just uh, move on with the management as, as other pancreatitis because every morphology Every disease uh, distinction of, of pancreatitis has a uh, different management. Uh, and I like this slide. It came from a professor in Stanford, uh, Brandon Weiser, who does a lot of pancreatic necrosectomies. And he uh, showed us this as a, um, a, a way to think of pancreatic necrosis uh, in the state of matter and the infection or sterility of the collection. So if you have a completely liquid collection and it's truly sterile, you're looking, you're looking at pseudocyst or peripancreatic collection in this area. If it becomes septic, then you look at infected pseudocyst infected necrosis if you become in the solid uh, part of the um, of this uh, diagram. So it's like a continuum. Don't think of it as boxes and uh, the treatment should be tailored on whatever, whatever you find in these patients. So we'll start with medical management. Uh, 
first of all, pancreatitis is an inpatient management. This is very important to know. Um, it's uncommon that these patients uh, will be treated at home. It's not like a mild diverticulitis that you can give them antibiotics and send them home. These patients need to be observed because the first week or the first few hours of, of management determines uh, the severity and determines the trajectory of where this, these patients will, will land in terms of interventions and, uh, and morbidity and mortality. And the first thing that we learned all, we all learned in medical school is fluid management for patients with pancreatitis. Think of pancreatitis as a massive burn in the retroperitoneal area. And these patients just have lots of fluid sequestration, either in the retroperitoneum or the pleural spaces or third spacing as we, we all learned. Um, and it's been uh, studied uh, how aggressive we need to be uh, in these patients in terms of, of management uh, and in terms of fluid management. Usually I would say all these patients will receive uh, the sepsis dose of fluid, which is 30 mils per keg when they arrive to the hospital or the emergency department, because most of them will be either not eating uh, for that day or continuously vomiting, showing signs of, of dehydration. Um, but also afterwards, uh, the recommendations still from the societies like American Gastroenterology Society or Association is to give them around 200 to 300 mils per, per hour of continuous crystalloids. Now, there is a recent study that's published 2022, and uh, it's a randomized controlled trial that um, tried to answer the question whether we need to be really aggressive in resuscitating these patients or giving them fluids moderately will also be okay or even change the outcome for these patients. And um, it's a pretty good study um, that showed aggressive resuscitation carries a higher risk of developing fluid overload as you will, as you will um, notice a lot in these patients and also any critically ill patients. Um, or patient, and also the development of, of severe pancreatitis is more in patients who have who were resuscitated aggressively. So they the moderate resuscitation in their protocol was 10 mil per keg bolus when they when they arrived, and then 1.5 mil per keg per hour, and the aggressive was 20 mil per keg bolus, and then three mils per keg per hour uh, as continuous infusion. Um, it's still some people use normal saline uh, for resuscitation. I probably will not use normal saline unless the patient is having TBI or something really specific in any critically ill patient. I will use a more um, a balanced crystalloid like the lactated ringer. And uh, some of the societies already put, their, uh, put that in their guideline. So my go-to fluid basically for resuscitation would be lactated ringers in these patients. Uh, Otaka, uh, I know yes. we said we'd save questions towards the end, mm -hmm. but uh, you, you're covering so much uh, material and truthfully, this is fantastic. Um, I felt like I wanted to just ask something about the liquids. Um, at my institute, we uh, did something similar. We were mm -hmm. very conservative in terms of the fluid resuscitation um, to the point where even sometimes the kidneys would start to shut down and we'd have a low threshold for CRRT. Um, what's your experience with that? How do you balance the fluid resuscitation with the kidney function? So for these patients, uh, in pancreatitis patients, usually you will rarely find patients who have uh, negative balance, I would say. Uh, most of them will be having positive balance. Uh, sometimes the organ dysfunction is multifactorial, is not only related to fluid resuscitation per se or pre-renal uh, dysfunction. Um, I would, uh, if, if the patient of pancreatitis re reaches the, uh, the time that they need the renal replacement therapy or C CRRT, 
first check their abdominal pressure as you know because this is one of the most uh, likely causes uh, of uh, organ dysfunction and abdominal compartment syndrome in these patients after resuscitation and always think about fluid that they are good until they're bad uh, so it's it's quite a balance between having a good urine output in these patients which you should have uh, for two things for fluid resuscitation monitoring and also for um, uh, to, to be able to, to monitor for uh, uh, complications like abdominal compartment syndrome. Um, in critically ill patients, usually I, I tend to uh, be on a strict in, intake output um, monitoring um, and then depend on bolusing fluids more than giving continuous infusions, especially patients on crit in ICUs they have a lot of infusions they take uh, in addition to the maintenance fluid, if you would say. Uh, so these needs to be summed up and put in the uh, uh, intake output, especially if your pancreatic heart patient on the floor is not in the ICU. This is a common issue uh, that we face. Uh, we don't have an accurate intake and output. I'm not sure if I had a patient uh, with uh, going to renal failure only because of pre uh, or pre renal dysfunction in terms of fluid. I mean, uh, but if if these patients uh, reach this level, I would say think about uh, in addition to fluid resuscitation, think about other things, especially systemic complications of pancreatitis that led to. Uh, uh, direct uh, renal injury um, uh, for them. Um, one thing to think about renal dysfunction as well is the amount of fluid you give the patient to sequestrate also in the tissues. So the kidney parenchyma can have edema and then goes into dysfunction because of how much fluid you're giving. So if you're giving too much fluid, that's something to think about uh, that these patients might develop um, kidneys, interstitial edema, um, retroperitoneal fluid sequestration, pleural effusions, and pulmonary edema. It's the same concept. Um, so too much fluid is bad. Too little fluid is bad as well. Uh, the balance is the way to go. Uh, don't leave these patients. The bottom line, don't leave, leave these patients without continuous infusions, uh, especially in the acute phase. And choose your rate and monitor that. So the CT scan, you saw that patient we presented, he had an early CT scan probably, or I'm not sure when was the CT scan was done, but in the US and most people here who practice know, uh, these patients get a CT scan from the get go, like before any physician even see them or provider. So uh, a patient comes with abdominal pain, it's an automatic CT scan for many of the uh, emergency departments. The yield, though, of CT scan in early pancreatitis is so low. And uh, there is a study, it's called the early study, uh, about CT scan uh, in patients with acute pancreatitis. 47% um, of the patients, almost half of them, get a CT scan. Uh, and half of these CT scan within the first four days. And none of the CT scans which were done, er done earlier showed necrosis or alternative diagnosis. And in majority of patients, 90% of patients, their diagnosis is not, their management is not altered by the result of the CT scan. So I would say um, do the CT scan, even if you think it's required in the first day or two, but make it uh, individual for each patient and don't just uh, order an automatic CT scan for acute pancreatitis only. Um, another study looked at the CT scan done on day one and 150 patients and compared seven CT scoring systems and two clinical scoring systems, mainly the Apache and the BICEP score. And the CT scan was not superior to clinical scoring in terms of predicting severity and guiding management of these patients. So uh, if you suspect uh, that the patient is having complication, it will show up in the first uh, for example, 72, 96 hours after admission, um, uh, do a CT scan. If the patient is having abdominal compartment syndrome, this is a clinical diagnosis mainly. If you think that the patient is spiking fever, 
in terms of probably they're having an abscess now or uh, something that we missed um, because of the severity of the pancreatitis, like very rare complications of small bowel ischemia or colonic perforation, then probably a CT scan. But um, I would reserve the CT scan for later because these patients will get a lot of them and then it will guide the management better. Um, the nutritional support, this has been evolving even during my training as uh, I'm PGY-12. So uh, starting as a PGY-1, this, these patients get automatic MPO like for days. Um, just give them fluid, keep them MPO, bowel rest, sometimes NG tubes uh, as you treat bowel obstruction. And uh, everybody knows about the sentinel jejunal loop that gets dilated on the X-ray of uh, patients with acute pancreatitis and you start looking for those. But lots of data we have about nutrition and patients with mild pancreatitis, they should have regular diet on, post, uh, on admission day one, basically. Uh, so the guidelines say start nutrition as soon as possible Oral nutrition, enteral, is better than TPN. If you have a reason to put patients on TPN, put them on TPN, but provide them nutrition as early as possible. So the fight and trial of enteral feeding or oral diet uh, in, in patients with severe acute pancreatitis uh, with, um, showed no difference in the primary endpoint, which is major infection or death, and oral diet was tolerated by 70% of these patients. Now, if you have patients who are vomiting continuously and not tolerating oral diet, yeah, it's not wise to have them in this misery. You can choose to put a post pyloric feeding tube or provide them with other nutritional uh, supporting measures, but provide nutrition for these patients. Re reduces infection, reduces death. Antibiotics. Don't give antibiotics for pancreatitis per se. So the recommendations from multiple uh, uh, associations say that antibiotic prophylaxis for uh, pancreatitis patients is not recommended. You are not preventing any uh, infection. Even if the patient is having sterile necrosis, you're not uh, giving prophylaxis to prevent that from being infected. But if the patient is having cholangitis associated with pancreatitis, Yes, that's an indication by itself. You're not giving the, um, the antibiotics for pancreatitis, you're giving it for cholangitis or complication of pancreatitis. If the patient is having fever and leukocytosis, you are suspecting pancreatitis, but this has a low yield in pancreatitis, believe it or not. You have to have an other, another evidence, uh, like a gas in the collection, or the patient is having bacteremia, to start them on antibiotics. And if you choose antibiotics, you either choose cephalosporins or a better option would be carpapenems, emipenems, and, and neuropenems. Yeah. Um, quick question. Um, yes. So obviously the um, carpapenems because of their pancreatic penetration, right? Right, right. And um, Again, you said we're, you know, PGY-12 and things have changed a lot. Um, there's also the British School of Thought, and I don't know mm -hmm. if you have any ideas on this, where they recommend antibiotics if there's greater than 30% uh, necrosis. We don't do it in the States, but I don't yeah. know if you have experience with that. Yeah, I, I now I'm, I'm having some flashbacks about hearing about it, but didn't, didn't even think of it, to be honest, like in the last... Patients, even when we were in Qatar, we didn't do that. Like yeah. uh, we didn't uh, choose that as a criteria to start patients on antibiotics. Um, but yeah, you will have different, even in, in the US, you'll have different uh, hospital guidelines or a surgeon preference in terms of when and what to start uh, in terms of antibiotics. Uh, so this brings us to the other question, how to diagnose infection in these patients? Uh, is there a role for FNA? We will see in the next slide. But as I said, fever and leukocytosis per se is largely unreliable. Um, the, probably the most accurate measure that we have is extraluminal gas on CT scan. And as I said, you will not find that on first or second day of pancreatitis. You would wait 
And if the patient is clinically deteriorating, showing signs of sepsis, like patients having hypotension, they're uh, having uh, continuous fibril, leukocytosis, they look uh, sick and ill, then the CT scan, if it has extraluminal gas in that collection, this is 95% accurate and you can start antibiotics on that merit uh, without sampling, uh, without taking an FNA. <laughs> the clinical deterioration by itself, like a patient was doing well in the floor for a couple of days and then the third day he's, he's requiring pressors and he's in the, in the ICU, then this is also an indication that an, uh, an infection could be brewing. Uh, FNA is 85% accurate, but is rarely required. Uh, and if you're doing it, you have to uh, pay attention to the false negative results, which is a, around quarter of patients. So in every, every four patients who do FNA for one of them has false negative results. And the serial raising uh, procalcitonin uh, is indicated in European literature. Uh, they, they followed that. And um, if it's increasing um, serially in the first uh, two or three days uh, post admission, then this is an indication for um, uh, this is an indication that you have an infection. But they didn't mention if this is uh, um, uh, an indication to start antibiotics in these patients. And I always think of procalcitonin as it, it depends on your clinical suspicion. If if it if it goes with your clinical suspicion, yes, follow it. If it's not, just look for another thing. The FNA, um, as we say, it's safe. We, in, in one point in my training, we had uh, lots of attendings say, you will introduce infection by doing FNA to the sterile necrosum, but that's not the case. There is no data to support that. FNA is safe. You're not doing it by uh, alcohol swab to the abdomen and then stick it with a needle. It's done in interventional radiology suite. It's like an OR. There is uh, full sterility. They prep the field and they do the FNA. So it can tell you uh, if you're stuck, if this is sterile or infected necrosis. But then um, just remember the false negative results, 12 to 25%. So if it comes negative, but your clinical suspicion of infection is there, treat it as infection. What are the indications for intervention? So you, you're medically managing the patient, but the, then you reach a level that this patient is not improving and we need to do something about it. Um, clinical deterioration, signs and symptoms of infection or infected pancreatic necrosis. You can do a CT scan and see and decide what is the, management, the best management option. We will talk about them briefly. And then after four weeks of uh, onset of disease, and you'll, you will hear a lot about four weeks and uh, as being a cutoff in terms of intervention for these patients. So if these patients have ongoing organ failure without signs of infection, necro infected necrosis, or if they have ongoing gastric outlet, biliary or duodenal obstruction because of the large uh, walled off necrosis, or if they have disconnected duct syndrome, or symptomatic or growing pseudocyst. Uh, these are indications to uh, intervene uh, for these patients um, after four weeks. But what about they don't have any of these, and then after eight weeks, they were, they're having ongoing pain or discomfort. This is what's called the persistent unwellness of pancreatitis patients. They will come feeling miserable, not being able to do their daily work, and they're having lots of pain, discomfort, some nausea. You scan them, you find this big collection. It's not resolving, then uh, this is probably uh, an indication to intervene in select uh, group of patients. And the timing of intervention is very important. Late is always better. This has been studied and verified. If you intervene early, mortality is higher. This being said, if you have an abdominal compartment syndrome, this is an immediate uh, indication for intervention. You don't wait on that, even if the patient is having severe pancreatitis. So you intervene on the abdominal compartment syndrome. Now, if you have necrosum in the abdomen that's pouring from the lesser sac, just scoop that out, but don't do anything heroic. Uh, do whatever is there. If you're inside the abdomen that time, you can do that. 
but not um, targeting the infected pancreatic necrosis uh, at that time. More than 14 days is preferred, but it's better to wait four weeks or 30 days. Uh, the early uh, intervention can augment uh, multi organ dysfunction, and the early debridement will require multiple take packs uh, to the OR or the theater, as uh, the British say. Uh, ERCP, there is probably now one indication for ERCP in patients with pancreatitis, which is acute cholangitis. So if they have cholangitis concomitant with acute pancreatitis, you can do ERCP and leave the obstruction. Um, there is no evidence that early or routine ERCP for uh, the uh, patients who have pancreatitis will um, affect the mortality or systemic complications if it's done for a legit reason like cholangitis. But you, you don't do it basically for pancreatitis unless the patient is having disconnected pancreatic duct syndrome and you need to drain the pancreatic duct into the duodenum. And, um, but otherwise, uh, cholangitis is the indication in the acute setting. And if you look at pancreatic necrosis, these patients are sick, these patients probably in the ICU, and you will need uh, a village to manage these patients. If you don't have a village, create one. Uh, seriously, if you don't have in your local hospital, if you don't have uh, a system to treat pancreatitis and you find yourself uh, taking care of these patients, uh, try to get some people on board with you because these patients require lots of things from critical care to nutritionists, to interventional radiologists, to gastroenterologists, um, to social workers, sometimes palliative medicine is consulted on these patients because of how severe is the disease. Um, so you have to determine your team, you have to gather the team, you have to determine what necrosis they have. Is it sterile or infected necrosis? You have to individualize the treatment for each patient. You will not take a 75 year old or 90 year old uh, frail patient to open necrosectomy. Um, you can just temporize with a drain and hope for the best. Uh, but the same management for a 35 year old, like open necrosectomy can, can result in a, in a different, uh, uh, different morbidity or mortality. Study the legion, study the necrosis, see the, how much is it related to the stomach? What is it related to the duodenum? Is it abutting the wall of the stomach that the gastroenterologist or advanced gastroenterologist can go in and, and drain that for you through transgastric approach? Uh, is it more to the right or left? Do you need to access, uh, if you're doing any necrosectomy, you'll do, you'll do it from the left, you're doing it from the right. Is it going down to the pelvis like a horseshoe in the retroperitoneum and you need to uh, target that as well if you're going for surgery or intervention. So these things has to be studied and planned uh, way ahead of any intervention. <clears throat> Uh, check who is with you in the hospital. If you if you have a big hospital that de deals with these things, like within the state or within the area in Jordan or in in in, in Qatar or wherever you are, just send them to these people. Um, it, it's probably okay for you to to do the uh, immediate things like uh, drain placement by your local experts, uh, intervention radiologists. But uh, more interventions, or if the patient requires more and more intervention, advanced interventions, don't wait. I've seen patients here <clears throat> in the US being treated in, in hospitals where they don't do that much. They have an advanced endoscopist, for example, who does the, um, the transgastric drainage, but he doesn't have the capacity to do that uh, multiple take packs to do the actual debridement. And these patients end up in the ICU having organ dysfunction. And when you try to transfer them to, to another institute that have the ab availability of endoscopists or the surgeons or the critical care team to take care of them, it's too late. And lots of times you're turned down because of that. So 
recognize that early, recognize your local expertise and, and transfer uh, when, when these patients uh, need that. And the strategies has been developing since uh, the 80s. Uh, we started with open necrosectomies with all the variations of open necrosectomies. Then people started to do that laparoscopic. And then this has developed into retroperitoneal debridement. We'll, we'll talk about that, uh, which is uh, closely related to the step-up approach and percutaneous drainage. And now the transgastric drainage has been taking off as well. And we'll see why is that. Uh, think of open necrosectomy. You'll hear a, a, a lot about step up. Open necrosectomy is step down approach. You start with the big gun and you start going down the route uh, after that. It's considered the gold standard because you open and remove, but I'm not sure if that's accurate anymore with all the data and studies that we have. Um, you, there are variable options with open necrosectomy or variations. You have open necrosectomy with open packing. You have open necrosectomy with closed packing. Uh, you have open necrosectomy with continuous closed post-operative lavage and programmed open necrosectomy. The one I did, I assisted in is the third one, open necrosectomy with continuous closed post-operative lavage because the surgeon does that only. So it's very, very, um, dependent on what the surgeon in your institute or the expert who comes and assists with these cases does. And you do as they do. So just some uh, depiction of, of how we do that, either a midline laparotomy or chevron incision. You go into the lesser sac, you open the gastrocolic ligament, uh, or sometimes you end up going through the, the transverse mesocolon into the pancreatic necrosum and drain through that. Uh, and then you scoop whatever is there. Uh, don't take whatever is adherent. Uh, you can take whatever is, uh, is, is easily coming. And then at the end, you just tack the stomach down to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the greater omentum or to the colon and put drains from each side, one for drainage and uh, one for irrigation, sorry, and the other port will be for drainage and you will lavage a lot. We had some patients who got 16 liters per day, 32 liters per day, depends on the protocol you have. Hate, nurses will hate it, everybody in the hospital will hate it. You have to pull some strings and, and talk to people to get you the, the fluid uh, out, outside the patient room. But it worked in some patients, it worked for that surgeon and we do it for some time. Uh, the open necrosectomy is sometimes the only option when you have a complication like a gastric or colon, colon infarction uh, and you need to go in for, to fix that and you also do the open necrosectomy at the same time. If there is bleeding, <clears throat> either like a spontaneous bleeding or a bleeding from another intervention like a, a video-assisted retroperitoneal debridement, which we do from the left side and we'll show you uh, some depictions of that. And uh, also, if the only expert in the hospital does that, there's no other way to do it. The patient needs it. You can transfer them, basically. Uh, then you do it this way. Uh, this is from Buschler, who uh, was in Germany, and he, he came to Doha multiple times and did these operations. I assisted him with that. Um, and he has these number of patients. He's been doing this since the 80s. And um, he has all these complications, like 44% of complications, mainly pancreatic fistula, but also he has, um, uh, if you see in comparison to other necrosectomies, the hemorrhage can reach up to 50%. The uh, fistula, either it's enteric or pancreatic fistula can reach up to 50%. Um, the mortality, I would assume, this is, yeah, this is the mortality uh, table, it can reach up to 47%. This, this study in 1998, they have 6%. Yeah, that's really impressive for, for uh, such an operation. But uh, Bigger, who, who was uh, the, uh, the chief uh, that Bushla worked under and the Bigger operation is, is named after, he had also 8% uh, mortality and 26 
percent of uh, uh, twenty seven percent of real apartum rate. Uh, so these the bottom line that these cases have or these this technique has lots of morbidity and mortality to take into account. Lots of uh, discussion with the patients because I didn't see a patient after this case uh, after these cases that go to their baseline. Um, they will end up either in a TCU if you have a TCU, or they will end up dependent on their family uh, and not be able to work afterwards, um, <clears throat> except for some of them. But they're alive. The proscopic negrosectomy is done by Garnier. Um, multiple things, multiple uh, variations of it, but basically it's a, the open procedure that you do laparoscopic. Um, it has its limitations because of the exposure and instrumentation, and uh, it requires drains afterwards. But this has evolved into the video assisted retroperitoneal debridement, or what was called uh, minimally invasive retroperitoneal debridement as well. So <clears throat> this has been published in 2010. Um, and uh, the step up approach was coined by this study. It's in Panther study uh, in Netherlands uh, between 20, 2005 and 2008. They randomized patients either to open necrosectomy or step up. The step up approach basically was a percutaneous drain and then uh, video assisted retroperitoneal debridement if necessary. Um, their main conclusions is that the drainage of infective fluid may be sufficient in some cases. They didn't go all the way up the ladder into video assisted debridement. And the minimally invasive technique provokes less surgical trauma and severely ill. Yeah, we know that. Uh, and then mortality is pretty much the same. Uh, so this is the major or the primary endpoint. It was a composite between the major complication and death. If you combine both of them, the major complication and death, the minimal invasive approach was less and statistically significant. But if you're talking about mortality alone, it's not, which you see here. And then the other outcomes like pancreatic fistula and incisional hernia, of course, it's less in the minimally inv invasive. Um, uh, and then here, it's an interesting thing that uh, how many uh, necrosectomies was done for each of these patients. Uh, then um, for, for the VARD group, you will see that 40% uh, of them had um, uh, 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 no, no necrosectomies, basically percutaneous drain alone. <clears throat> And this is the recent follow-up for these patients. It's published 2019, like uh, uh, nine years after the original study, and showing that step up approach has longer survival and then other complications, uh, other long-term complications less in the uh, step up approach. The percutaneous drain is very efficient in the initial period. It temporizes the infection it can give the patient a lifeline till, till you reach the four weeks uh, cutoff and you can do something about that necrosum. So basically you will need a, a drain or two, uh, sometimes 10 drains, uh, as one of the interventional radiologists was telling me about a patient they had, he had 10 drains at, at one point, like at a given point. So they, you do the drains, it has 10 to 30% of success, but Definitely in the acute phase, this will temporize the sepsis and give you time to go uh, more and wait more till you do the uh, actual debridement. Uh, the, um, the VARD or the MIRP, uh, it's basically, a, a, um, it was a, a track guided uh, debridement. So you put the drain, you leave the drain there, and this drain creates a track, you go over the track and do the debridement. Uh, at first it was this version of it. So you open a big incision in the left flank because that's the most likely location of your drain. You follow the drain to the necrosum and then you uh, take out or do necrosectomy as in this picture. Uh, you leave the drains afterwards and uh, just keep, keep doing that as necessary. Uh, or you can just do a very small incision, uh, like um, a keyhole, which is laparoscopic uh, incision. You do it either with laparoscopic instruments or laparoscopic ports, 
or what we used here, this is the, if you would say, not the HD version of the VARD, it's the, um, it's the rigid nephroscope. So this is the second VARD we did in Qatar, basically. And it was uh, with the help of the urologist. So we brought the urologist in. We told him you're expert in the retroperitoneal, basically. Kidneys is, is below you, the spleen is above you. Just get us an axis as you get for percutaneous uh, nephrolithotripsy. And they put this sheet into the retroperitoneum and we go with the rigid nephroscope that has uh, a channel that you can uh, put these small scissors and do the debridement. It took forever. Like these things are really small. You're talking about like two millimeter, two, 2.7 millimeter channel to put that um, uh, forceps in and take uh, these small pieces out. So no big chunks in this procedure, but um, it temporizes stuff. It did the work in some of patients. Uh, we, one of them uh, required multiple drains even after this procedure. And um, one of them just uh, had one of these and, uh, and then lived with the drain till the, all the necrosis was out. Now the high definition or 4K version of it, you will see this basically. Same axis you will get through a guide wire and the OR, uh, you will put the sheet and then you use big laparoscopic ports a 10 and a five probably, and you put a new more retroperitoneum, if you would say, you'll use a 10 or five scope and then you'll use big laparoscopic instruments to do that. Now, what we do here in, in, uh, in uh, University of Minnesota, we use a 15 millimeter uh, port and we use a five, so it's, a, it's only a single port and you put a five millimeter scope and you, beside it, you put your instrument and do the debridement. It's very effective. Uh, then you will end up having the patient uh, with a drain. They drain it, and um, in about a month, uh, they're probably out of the hospital. Uh, what about the endoscopic approach? Uh, this study compared the endoscopic or surgical step-up approach. Uh, the, uh, they randomized patients into the endoscopic uh, group or the step-up approach, which is the uh, uh, drain uh, plus minus the, uh, the uh, minimally invasive uh, or video-assisted debridement. Uh, <clears throat> the, again, uh, concurring with the uh, Panther study, 51% of the surgical step-up were managed only with percutaneous drain. They didn't need any uh, fancy scopes or surgery. And 27% of the endoscopic group required additional perk drain. So the endoscopy uh, was effective in managing these patients. Uh, and then the major complications is equal, equal mortality and pancreatic fistula, you would expect it higher in the endoscope, in the percutaneous or step-up group, group because you're draining the pancreas to the outside versus you're draining the uh, uh, pancreas to the stomach in the endoscopic group. And shorter uh, duration of stay in the endoscopy. So basically what you do, you go in with the, with the scope or the advanced gastroenterology will go there and they put something called the uh, lumen opposing stent um, they dilate that tract between the stomach, posterior wall, stomach, and the pancreatic necrosis, and multiple take, ba take backs required to do the debridement. It's effective because of a simple fact, basically, is that this is an image of it. So this is the stent. They go and snare whatever they can with the with the scope, and they push it down to the post pyloric uh, area or the duodenum. So why it works? This is. Uh, pancreatic necrosis sent from actual patients to the, this professor in New Zealand, and uh, he tested uh, these on, uh, he tested multiple solutions on the pancreatic necrosis and what's effective to liquefy that. The most effective thing is the gastric juice, basically, more than anything else. So if you open the stomach into the pancreas, to provide gastric juice into that necrosis to liquefy and dissolve it. Um, some, something pops in this 
uh, when you think about it, most of these patients are on PPIs, like when they're in the ICU basically, or intubated. The, uh, the go around to that is you stop the PPI for two days or three days, and then you do the transgastric approach. You allow it to, to go into that necrosis, and then probably you'll have better results. So the transgastric allowed eff uh, effective debridement uh, in one intervention, uh, but many of these will, 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 will require multiple take backs. Uh, it avoids fistula and wound complications. And when the anatomy permits, probably it's the best intervention, either lab or open. And then, and this transgastric, what I mean by it, if you do it uh, by open surgery, but not by the endoscopist. The endoscopist need to take these back uh, multiple times, if you two, two to three days to do the debridement because of how small their instruments are. But if you're doing transgastric debridement, like by open surgery or by laparoscopic surgery, you will be better off um, with uh, doing that in one in, in one go. So rather than going through the lesser sac, you go into the anterior wall of stomach and then posterior wall of stomach. You debride that. You keep uh, an opening between the stomach and the pancreas and uh, allow it for further debridement. Um, and probably this internal fistula will not be noticed six weeks from your debridement. So the take home messages, um, successful management of necrotizing pancreatitis is not defined by avoiding surgery. Surgery in many patients is necessary and should be tailored to these patients. No single approach is appropriate for all patients. So you, uh, you better uh, be having lots of expertise treating these patients and lots of uh, interventions or uh, uh, instruments in your arsenal. Uh, the strategy of management should be individualized to patients and local expertise. A multidisciplinary approach is key. And to be honest, nobody can do that without the proper uh, support uh, from nutritionists, um, social workers, palliative care, critical care, and uh, gastroenterologists. Even we couldn't do our uh, first VARD without urology help and interventional radiology help that uh, lead us through the, uh, the, the case. Uh, when anatomy allows, transgastric approach probably allow uh, this, a significant benefit in terms of morbidity, morbidity, mortality, and complications, and also uh, allowing you to do that in, in one intervention. Thank you, and I'm open for any question. Not quite sure if. No, oh, there he is. Well, I have uh, one comment or one question. Um, one comment is uh, when it comes to the obligatory fluids in ICU patients, critical patients, uh, you'll be surprised by how much extra fluids they get. Um, this is a subject I have a lot, huge interest in. I published on it too. And on average, it's about one and a half liters of fluids that you don't even count for between flushes, between IV drips, and all the other stuff. So is much more than you think. And uh, when you take it into account, it all adds up. So you just, it's something uh, to mention. My question is, is there any role for um, feeding tubes at the time of open pancreatic necrostectomy, such as, um, uh, you know, jejunostomy tubes or gastrostomy tubes? Just a question from a vascular surgeon. Yeah, that's a great question, actually. And many, many, uh, of the surgeon have that in their protocol. You're going in to do pancreatic necrosectomy. You give the patient a jejunostomy tube uh, for feeding. Um, most of these patients will require, uh, like will be really sick, intubated and not having uh, an, an internal access. Uh, G tubes can be an option, uh, but if they have uh, gastric delay or uh, uh, any reason that they cannot um, uh, have uh, adequate nutrition through that, you can either do a gastro tube, like a GJ tube, or from the get-go, you get a jejunostomy feeding tube and the index operation. But that's, uh, that's very commonly done in these patients. Okay, I think I see Aoni's hand up. And I think we have a small enough panel where we can actually have people um, ask freely. So Aoni, um, go for it. 
Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you so much for the comprehensive lecture. This is uh, amazing. I and mean, uh, kind of what you uh, put in this lecture is amazing. It's like, you know, uh, very comprehensive and you cover everything. First question, uh, any ideas about Peltazar classification for CT scan? What are your thoughts about it? Uh, uh, I know kind of people back and forth between different uh, classification system. I don't know kind of if you are in favor of this or not. Second question, uh, do you think uh, acute or severe acute pancreatitis, do you think this patient belongs to the surgical ICU or medical ICU? I'm a surgical intensivist and uh, I have like, you know, a lot of questions about the, that and debates between like, which way can it will be better to serve the patient? And I just wanna hear what your thoughts about that. Great, thank you so much. Um, uh, great questions. The first one, basically, uh, uh, Baltazar, if I remember correctly, is about the percentage of necrosis in these patients in the CT scan. I usually don't look at that, uh, or even I can't remember uh, a CT report that I read that uh, told me a patient has a, a 50% or 30% necrosis in their um, in their in their abdomen. Probably it's more academic uh, a way to describe necrosis. And to be honest, the way to describe it or you can choose either this classification or not. The most important thing is how to manage uh, whatever uh, pathology we have. Uh, recognize the uh, the most important things like having gas in that collection that needs uh, treatment uh, as infected necrosis, either by uh, antibiotic or or, or drainage. Um, the second question uh, about surgical intensivists and medical intensivists, I'm also now a trained surgical intensivist and I've seen pancreatitis patients admitted to medicine and many like even like from the ED, uh, either alcohol or goldstone pancreatitis go to the medical service, which I don't agree with. Uh, this is a surgical disease and they better be served in surgical ICUs and surgical uh, floors. Now, to your point, when these patients develop complications, they end up in the surgical ICU, one way or another. Uh, they have, uh, especially if they have like a surgical complication, abdominal compartment syndrome, or they have an infected necrosis, even when we accept patients from outside hospitals, we accept, accept, accept them into the surgical ICU, not the medical ICU. Um, in community hospitals where you don't have uh, like a distinction between surgical ICUs and medical ICUs and you have a pancreatitis patient, yes, they're admitted and medical team or intensivist team take care of them, whether they're surgeons or uh, anesthetists or um, um, internists. But at the end, if they need uh, surgical expertise, they should be transferred to surgical ICU. I'm not aware of data that shows the difference in outcomes between patients who are managed in surgical ICU or medical ICU, uh, but that, that's going to be interesting if, if something uh, you know about. Yeah, I looked up if there's any data difference in that. I don't think so, but I can I will say like we have a small a small experience like when we had the COVID-19 surge and we looked at, uh, we managed some COVID-19 patients in our ICU in Wayne State versus medical ICU, we did not have like any selection bias and what patients will get to us, they're just whatever a bit available in the surgical unit. And and that sample size, we found our outcomes were kind of better regarding length of stay, extubation and time to tracheostomy. And I think it's a, mental, it's a good mentality that we have more surgical intensivists available because uh, right. I think sometimes being more aggressive early on will be nice. So this will be a nice project to think about down the road to compare kind of outcomes versus two groups compare medical versus uh, surgical IC management for acute severe pancreatitis. That's right. That's right. And remember, pancreatitis in Qatar, for example, it was a surgical disease. These patients come to the surgical service. At one point, um, probably three, four years ago, it was changed. And now medical team takes care of these patients and they consult us uh, for index lab coli, for example, or, or any complications. And this brings me to something that I missed uh, probably during the presentation, one of the key management things in these patients, especially in, in our area, even in the US, uh, for gallstones pancreatitis, when they come with mild pancreatitis, they should have the gallbladder removed at the index admission. You will, surpri you will be surprised how many um, 
uh, providers don't do don't know that uh, if this patient ends up in the hospitalist service, probably they will treat the acute pancreatitis and then send the patient home, and you'll see the patient in the clinic four weeks from. Uh, initial hospitalization, and then you will book them for lab coli um, whenever your schedule allows. Uh, but the data shows, exactly, the data shows that these patients have 60% risk of developing recurrent pancreatitis in the first six months. So index uh, cholecystectomy in these patients is very important. Now, if you have severe necrotizing pancreatitis or severe pancreatitis due to cold stones pancreatitis, you can wait in these patients six to eight weeks after a resolution of, of pancreatitis. But uh, milder forms or milder pancreatitis should get the gallbladder out uh, within the, the, the index admission. I have one more question uh, for you since you mentioned about transgastric, uh, which is I know it's from experience that kind of we're seeing in these. Do you think as a complication from transgastric uh, necrosectomy, do you think the incidence of uh, like uh, having pseudoaneurysms and uh, require IR embolization uh, for like the bleeding uh, from like the debridement per se, do you feel there's any difference between the transgastric versus the uh, minimal invasive uh, retroperitoneal uh, lapar laparoscopic debridement? Do you think there's any difference in that uh, specific outcome or no? I'm, I'm not aware of any data to say that. Uh, I didn't read it. I'm not sure if there is something to uh, to say about it. But even like splenic RT aneurysm, these patients is, is probably in the lower uh, incidence and uh, uh, probably it happens whether you do either of these interventions because of the disease itself, like a complication with the disease. I've seen one bleeding complication from uh, video assisted uh, retroperitoneal debridement, which we needed to pack and then send the patient to the IR. And it was not a pseudo aneurysm. It was just a bleeding from, from a vessel, like a branch from uh, the, the, the splenic. Um, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not aware of any difference in, in the, that and in the, in the incidence of this specifically in any of the interventions. I will also jump on that train. I'm not surgical critical care trained, but in training, we had a lot of ICU experience. And um, that's definitely something we saw that these patients were better off in a surgical ICU. And more times than not, we'd always you know, by the time you get consulted by the MICU, you, you're behind the eight ball. You're just a little bit too far behind. And usually by that time, you're doing, you know, the decompressive x laps and, you know, trying to get back back on, on track. Um, also, speaking of, of uh, transgras transgastric approaches, um, I did one robotic just because we didn't have the EGD expertise. Um, it, it was okay. We were able to clean out. It was fairly small, but truly when you have a skilled, advanced um, endos endos uh, endoscopic surgeon, um, there's one gentleman I trained under, um, he would spend two hours during these necrosectomies and completely clear it out. The amount of debridement was phenomenal. And the outcomes were always um, excellent. So that, that's an additional push towards, you know, GI folks who are good, good and skilled. And like you said, you have them in your armamentarium where you can fall back on them. Um, but yeah, um, I see Amjad has his hand up. And uh, so I'll hand it off to him. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you for the comprehensive lecture, uh, uh, Dr. Bataka. Uh, it was really nice and comprehensive. Uh, and thank you, Rasul, with the Jazz Japa uh, efforts you are taking. Uh, my, I have two questions, actually. Now, regarding the drains and the leverage, when do you stop, stop doing that? And do you follow, like, the MLA's level with that? And how will this, like, affect the CT scan, further CT scan imaging uh, uh, that might, like, if you want to consider? My uh, second question is, uh, uh, you know, back in Qatar, we've noticed that they... They were like following the uh, CRP to to consider when to take the patients for lab coli or not. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, two great questions. So the first one, yes, we followed Emily's level. If you're doing uh, lavage, uh, you basically the theory is: is there any small ducts 
uh, that's leaking uh, from the uh, from the pancreas when you do the necrotectomy, uh, you would uh, assume that the lavage will uh, help in scarring them down. This is the theory, uh, uh, but probably only time takes care of that. So we we used to do daily amylase from the uh, from the drainage, and when it's less than uh, four hundred, we stop. Uh, or we decrease and check again. If it goes back up, we go back up in the rate and so on. Uh, so the two aims of the lavage would be having clear liquids coming from the drainage ports or drainage uh, uh, catheters, and also the MLS level to be uh, lower. Uh, the second question about CRP, you will see some guidelines uh, about pancreatitis itself that code CRP level of I think 1400 or something uh, to be uh, an indication of severe acute pancreatitis. Now, there is one retrospective analysis that looked at CRP relation, uh, CRP um, level and relation of complications post lab coli. And they, um, the study showed that CRP level above 200 uh, increases the complication if, they if you take the patient for lab, for lab coli. To be honest, this is a retrospective data and uh, probably will lead you to an anecdotal practice of, of medicine in terms of when to, to take these patients to the OR. Uh, lots of, of, of practices and uh, uh, reputable uh, universities, surgeons, and even uh, uh, associations and guidelines don't recommend you checking any labs even lipase, ALT, AST, before you take patients to the OR for lab coli. If they're eating, tolerating that well, the pain is subsiding, and their exam is fine, take them and take the gallbladder out. Uh, I will still do that, uh, uh, regardless of what uh, probably one retrospective study say. You would have the complication of lab coli as in any other probably uh, lab coli you, you, you're you doing, uh, either for cholecystitis, probably cholecystitis is higher even uh, uh, in terms of, uh, of taking lab colis in post-pancreatitis patients. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. The way I think about it is... Um, you look at two things, right? Uh, number one, physiologically, will they handle the general anesthesia? And two, are their symptoms in control enough where postoperatively, if a complication happens, you can discern, <coughs> is this from before um, or after? And um, there was one more thing you had mentioned and it completely slipped my mind at this point. Um, oh yeah, complications after uh, acute cholecystitis, definitely harder, definitely much harder. Um, and with that, do we have any further questions? All right, well, again, thank you very much. Um, the lecture was um, truthfully phenomenal. Uh, you hit on all the big points and you know so much information. Um, I'm even walking away with a portion of my management uh, changed um, in terms of how I approach these acute pancreatitis patients. So thank you very much uh, for taking the time and putting everything together. And uh, I see Anand is here, so I'll hand it off to him as well. Well, great lecture. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And we'll see you all next month. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate your efforts, all of you, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to present. Thanks all. Thanks Excellent. for attending.